You are now watching our Fordham Manor YouTube channel. God bless you. For those of you uh, wanting or needing to worship in the evening, we have Living Light Worship. Next one, look for a card up there, up front, and pretty soon we will be stepping it up to two services per month. Uh, but Living Light Worship is a church, a baby church, that's, that uh, is planted by Fordham Manor Church. It's in what you would call the incubation stages right now. You know, so we are kind of like a larvae. <laughs> you know, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, pray for us. And if you know folks who want to come, maybe they work on Sunday or something, they could come out in the evening. It's a pretty uh, cool, relaxed atmosphere. We, we emphasize creativity. Don't, you don't have to ask me. Ask someone who's been there. Uh, you can also like us on Facebook, Living Light Worship, okay? So uh, praise God. And the rest of you, pray for this thing, right? Uh, pray for your little sister. <laughs> so uh, Father, I pray, Lord God, that you would control me, Lord God. Keep my craziness at bay. Let your word just take over, Lord God. Open hearts, open minds, and let your will be done in this place as it is in your place. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, praise God. And first slide. Uh, happy Resurrection Day. The tomb is empty. Let's just go to the word of God. Uh, let's read it together. Next slide. Um, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 5 together. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Okay? And then next, and then jumping down to verse 14 to 19. And if Christ had not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ had not been risen, raised either. And if Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile. Or as the Borg would say, ooh, futile. Uh, uh, you, you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. For if only for this life we have hope in Christ, then we of all people most to be pitied. We're pathetic. Okay, so that's the word of God. Title of the sermon is um, The Resurrection Matters. And if it sounds familiar, it's because I've, I've delivered it before. So now you might be thinking, uh, okay, so maybe Vinny's being lazy, or maybe it needs to be said again. It's up to you. <laughs> so. Okay, next. Uh, just over two years ago, in January 2015, a well-known theologian by the name of Marcus Borg. Oh, that was, wow. Wow, Borg. Yeah, uh, Marcus Borg died. Now, he, was, he taught in universities. He wrote books. He lectured all over the world. He was on TV and media all over the place. And he was one of the leaders of a movement called the Jesus Seminar. Uh, he held some pretty unconventional views about Christianity. And uh, this is what he believed about the resurrection. As a child, I took for granted that Easter meant that Jesus literally rose from the dead. I now see Easter very differently. For me, it is irrelevant whether or not the tomb was empty. 
whether Easter involves something remarkable happening to the physical body of Jesus is irrelevant. Now, I don't mean to be facetious or flippant in my response, but that is the dumbest thing to ever come out of the mouth of someone claiming to be a scholar of the New Testament in Christianity. It's just plain dumb. Uh, and when I say dumb, I mean it's, it sounds so ill-informed and out of sync with Christianity. Uh, it's either dumb or it's disingenuous or it's, being, or it's dishonest, right? And if it's not that, then the worst case scenario, it is inspired by the evil one. It's demonic. That's the only way I can reconcile that quote with somebody who studies uh, the New Testament. You know what? It sounds like, it sounds to me like someone who wants Christianity without the baggage or perceived baggage of a physical resurrection or, or, or the baggage that it might present, particularly in academic circles. So this was his way around, uh, uh, you know, declaring you know, Christianity, but without declaring a, a physical resurrection. Mr. Borg, you're wrong. Um, next. So I'm here to say that the resurrection does matter, and it matters a lot. And I want to cover, I want to present six biblical reasons. Now, there are more, a whole lot more, a lot, a lot of more. But I just want to co cover six arguments from that same Bible that Mr. Borg, that Professor Borg claimed to be an expert in and was paid money to teach. So these are six biblical reasons why the resurrection matters. I need you to repeat after me. The resurrection matters. <laughs> say it again if you mean it. If you don't mean it, don't say it. So, reason number one, next slide. The resurrection matters because Paul said it mattered. Now, who was Paul? Number one, Paul was a scholar, one of the sharpest minds of his time and of all time to explore and unpack the Old Testament and how it relates to Jesus and how Jesus relates to the Old Testament. Uh, his Jewish education was in, in Jerusalem, and he under a rabbi, Gamaliel, right, who was, uh, that was one of the top schools, right, and actually Gamaliel was uh, Rabbi Hillel's grandson, if, uh, if, and Hillel looms large in uh, Jew Jewish uh, thought and scholarship. But Paul was, so Paul was a scholar. He knew what he was talking about when he was unpacking the scriptures. Paul was not only a scholar, Paul was an apostle. Now you have people nowadays who call themselves apostle, you know, blue shoe or something like that. But Paul was one of, Paul was the apostle on the um, level or in the company of the 12, right? He wrote what, was two, what became two-thirds of the New Testament. He planted churches throughout the Roman Empire, which led Christianity to have a firm establishment and roots in Europe which meant that Christianity would go around the world. Believe it or not, if you call yourself a Christian, the chances are, most likely, that you are a Christian because of the work of Paul, right? We are all Paul's children, in a sense, spiritual children. Thank you, Daddy Paul, Papa Paul. So uh, the thing is, so Paul was not only a scholar, he was an apostle. But more than that, Paul was a witness, he was a witness to the risen Christ. And that witness led, led him from being a terrorist who hunted down, arrested, and killed Christians to someone who was willing to lay his life down for the very cause he was trying to kill. He was willing to be murdered for something that he committed murder to stop. Now, how do you explain this turnaround, this 360? It wasn't because, you know, he lost an argument. It wasn't because he read it in a book. 
It wasn't because he thought it, he just thought it would be nice to change. I got to turn over a new leaf. I'm a rotten guy. Let me turn over a new leaf. It wasn't that. It wasn't because he thought it would make life easy for him, right? It wasn't thought that he thought that life would be more socially or economically advantageous to become a Christian. It was due to an encounter with the risen Christ. And I'll tell you something. That's what saves people, an encounter with the risen Christ. Right, so, and it was this same Paul who said that the resurrection was of first importance. Let's, hear, let's read what Paul said. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word that I preached you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received and passed on to you is of first importance. He didn't say it was potentially important. He didn't say it was somewhat important. He didn't even say it was very important. He said it was of first importance. Now, with all due respect to Professor Borg, who is he to say that Paul didn't mean what he said? Or, or, or that he knows the gospel better than Paul? No, Professor. The resurrection matters. Reason number two. For what I received... I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. The resurrection verifies that Jesus is the Messiah, right? It's one thing if Jesus' message was well, I'm a good guy, and when I die, I want you to think fondly of me and take those fond memories and let them inspire you to be good people. If that was Jesus' message, then Borg was right. The res resurrection didn't matter that much. But if Jesus' message was, I am the way, the truth, and the light, no man comes to me apart from the Father. If Jesus' message was, I am the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If Jesus' message was, I am the one in whom the scriptures and the messianic prophecies are fulfilled. If Jesus' message was, before Abraham was, I am. If Jesus' message was, I am the Christ. If that was Jesus' message, then the resurrection has to matter, right? The people who anticipated the resurrection, the Jews of that time, who, were invest, who invested their hopes into the Messiah to come, they expected more from their Messiah than just being a good guy whose memory would, might inspire them to be good people. The Messiah had to be their hero. The Messiah had to be their deliverer and their redemption. The Messiah had to be their proof that God had not forsaken them, right? Nothing says God is in control like a resurrection, eh? If Jesus' is, see, if Jesus is mission was merely to make bad people good, a lot of people think nowadays think of Christianity as like the, the point of Christianity and religion is to make bad people good. If that's the case, then the resurrection doesn't matter. But if Jesus' mission was to make dead people live, yeah. do the resurrection matters. Say it. The resurrection matters. The next... Uh, The next reason, reason number three, back, back please, back one please, thank you. The resurrection matters in reason number three because it validates faith in Christ. 
And if Christ had not been raised from the dead, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Uh, if, only, if only for this life we have hope, then we are of, I'm sorry, and we are of all people most to be pitied. If what Borg is saying is true, then I am looking out at a pitiful bunch. And I am one of the leaders of this pity party. Right? If what Borg is saying is true. See, what happens here, Paul paints Christianity into a corner. Right? There's no way around it. He's saying, if there is no resurrection, if there's nothing beyond this material realm, then guess what? Evolution is correct. And it's all about survival of the fittest. It's all about the, weak, the strong eating and consuming the weak. It's all about the big fish swallowing the little fish. Too bad, little fish, you were too slow. If there's nothing beyond this material realm, the materialism is correct. And the one who dies with the most toys win. The one, the one you know, just it's all about me. If, if, if there's nothing beyond this material realm, then hedonism is correct. And we can forget about loving your neighbor, right? And let your belly be your God. And live according to your appetites. Eat, drink, party, for tomorrow we die. If this is all there is, then all of this spiritual seeking and internal, you know, soul searching is just self-deception and futility. But if it isn't all there is, then where will you place your bets? Uh, years ago, I wrote a poem based on an, the same idea as uh, Pascal's wager. And uh, the poem was called, Is It a Deal? Uh, actually, we sang it in a band I was in. And it goes like this. If I'm wrong, I'll go to my grave, a religious fanatic. No heaven waiting, only a cold, dark grave. Nonetheless, my self-deception would have given me at least a measure of peace in this lifetime. If you're wrong, you go to hell. Is it a deal? And that's what we're faced with here. That's what we're faced with here. Where are you going to put your chips? Where are you going to wage, wager, basically, where are you going to put, place your bets? Where, on which, on which card will you place your eternal soul? As for me and my house, we're going with Paul. We're going with the resurrection. We're serving the Lord. Because the resurrection matters. Say it. Because the resurrection matters. Reason number four. When the perishable... This is verse 54 and 55. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? This is important, especially as it pertains to uh, spiritual warfare. Death is a terrorist that tells us to be afraid. Death is a liar as telling us that he is the ultimate winner. Death is a pessimist, a naysayer, who's telling us to just give up. What are you fighting for? No matter how faithful you are, no matter how brave you are, when it's all said and done, when it's all over, I'm going to get you anyway. You still belong to me. But the resurrection matters because it reveals death as not as big and as bad as it wants us to think it is. 2,000 years ago, Jesus took care of the big one, right? Yeah. 
and death could come around. Hey, I'm bad. Ah, I got bad breath. Ah. But guess what? Jesus made, Jesus made it so we could look at death and say, you ain't so bad. You know? And the threat of you doesn't change my trajectory. Right? Why? Because Amen. Reason number five, again, pertaining to spiritual warfare. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. And that's Romans 8.11. We have resurrection power living in us, right? What that means is that, that if it was just a matter of our ability to be inspired by Jesus' example to be God, to be good people, then the resurrection is irrelevant. But if our struggle is against more than flesh and blood, if there's a spiritual, supernatural, transcendent dimension to our existence and by extension to our struggle to be what God wants us to be, then it stands to reason that we would need supernatural power to achieve that struggle. Some of us are basically bringing a slingshot to a gunfight when we're, when we're trying to use our willpower. Or I would just, you know, I will be better, I will be better, I will be good. That's like bringing a pea shooter to, to World War II. You know, we need spiritual power. We need real power. We need the same power that rose Christ from the dead. But guess what? It's in you. If you believe in him and if you are his, that power is in you. And that power is the Holy Spirit. You know, what do you think? The Holy Spirit, why, do we, why are we filled with the Holy Spirit? Just so that you could speak in tongues and show off and think that you're better than the other guy? Come on. The Bible says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be witnesses, you know, right? <laughs> you know, so that same power that conquered death and took care of death the big one, lives in me and lives in you and can take care of whatever challenge you're facing. The resurrection matters because it's the difference between victory and defeat. And the sixth reason. The resurrection matters is because we will stand before a risen Christ. It says, Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead. And in 2 Timothy, in Revelation, it says, they called out aloud, in a loud voice, saying, how long, O servant, sovereign Lord, I'm sorry, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? And that's a kind of a partial comfort for those of us, for those among, for those who are dying right now for the gospel. God, Jesus will avenge. But my point here is that the resurrection matters because it is, at, because Christ is actually risen. And if Christ is actually risen, then that means that each one of us will stand before him either in worship or in judgment. In worship, and the thing about standing directly in front of Christ is that it's unfiltered, it's unfettered, it's un unencumbered, it's straight, it's full power. So if we're standing in, him, in front of him in worship, then that means it is an unfiltered, unfettered, pure flow of worship back and forth, a pure flow of love. You think worship is good now? Where do you taste that? Amen? Right? Unfiltered presence of God. But if we're standing before him in judgment, then it's also an unfiltered, 
unencumbered. Taste of his wrath. Taste of the righteous, holy, just punishment that we all deserve for our sin and rebellion against a patient God. So if Jesus rose from the dead, if it's true that Jesus rose from the dead, then right now, Marcus Borg is experiencing one of those two realities. And Marcus Borg knows something right now, that the resurrection matters. I'm not trying to beat up on the guy. Oh, yes, I am a little bit. Yeah, sure. <laughs> because he preached lies. So, yeah, I'm beating up on the guy. So, uh, now here's the thing. You may not be a theologian writing books and lecturing on the credibility of the resurrection, but you are making a statement of your belief and trust in the resurrection by the way you live your lives every day, by the choices you make. You are either saying, I believe, I trust that Jesus rose, is alive, and empowers me, and I, one day I will stand face to face by him. And like Marcus Borg and countless millions, we're going to find out. How we live is our pro theological proclamation. You could say, oh, I believe this, that, that, and that, and that. But then when you step outside and you make your choices, that is your theological proclamation. Now, I'm not here to coerce you or manipulate you or trick you or play with your emotions. But I'm just asking you straight up. If you're willing, you know, you could, it's your choice. You live with your choices. And we die with our choices. But if you're willing to bet and entrust your eternal soul on a resurrected, living Jesus, I'm going to ask you to take a step. In church, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy, ironic, that this step would be considered a bold step in church, in a house of worship, where people worship in Jesus Christ. But if you're willing to lay your chips on the resurrection, if you're willing to cast your lots, with Paul instead of Borg, if you're willing to believe the word of God or at least trust the word of God, then I'm going to ask you to stand, just stand right in your seat, right where you are, place your hand on your heart, and pray, pray the following prayer with me. Anybody is willing to put their chips with the Lord. God bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. I don't know, you know, I don't know what happens on the other side of life. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> but I'm trusting and I'm betting that the word of God is true. So please repeat this prayer after me, with me. Lord, I am grateful that you lived, died, rose to rescue me. Forgive me for all the wrong things that I've done in my life. In word, thought, and deed. Forgive me for living and choosing like someone who doesn't expect to see you in eternity. Enlighten my heart to the reality of your resurrection. Fill me with your spirit. Empower me to run this race. Use me to bring life and truth to others. Cause me to think. Cause me to speak. Cause me to feel. Cause me to live like someone for whom the resurrection matters. And thank you for taking care of the big one.
In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Thank God. Now, if you would like to, uh, if you would like to pray with somebody and and get like connected, we want to make sure that we uh, come alongside of you in your spiritual journey, and that you know you're not in this alone. Neither are we. We're all in this together. If you would like to connect and uh, with the church further, Pastor Joe is right here, and he will take you to the. Um, the room over there, um, <laughs> the re- yeah, primary room, <laughs> yeah, okay? So uh, praise God. Follow, follow Pastor Joe. Those of you who want to go with prayer, Pastor Joe. So praise the Lord. Thank you guys for worshiping. We are privileged. We are privileged people to, to, to gather together. And, and while we do suffer maybe a hard time, you know, people call us names and, and maybe laws are passed that, that don't reflect our values, we are still privileged in comparison to our brothers and sisters who are literally losing their heads around the world, who are being thrown in jail and, and, and killed in very different ways. So uh, thank you for joining us and and worshiping with us. Uh, Never take worship for granted. uh, And and take worship at home. You don't have to just be here to worship. Worship at home. Worship with your friends, you know. Um, Worship in the park, under the trees, you know. But, you know, we're privileged and we don't, and we shouldn't take it for granted. So Guess what? It's good weather for worship outside right now, so I just want to encourage you to do so. Worshiping in 80 degrees, yeah, nothing better. So may the Lord, may the Lord's peace and blessings stay with you all and follow you and be with you. May God give you strength to walk this race and live life like the resurrection matters in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching our Fordham Manor YouTube channel. For further information, please visit our website at fordermanor.org. May God bless you.